I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verse number 2. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 2. At Balfour, we affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 2. I'd like you to visualize in your mind. You're there in Philippi. Epaphroditus has just returned with a letter from Paul. The church has assembled themselves together to hear what the apostle has written. Now, throughout this letter, Paul has emphasized unity. If you remember, this letter is addressed to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. If you recall how Paul urged the church, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel." Paul had laid before this church a series of commands in Philippians 2, verse 2. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Then in chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then in Philippians 3, 15 through 16, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So the church was there assembled together. Eodia and Syntyche, they knew that there was disunity between them. You can only imagine as this letter was being read, Eodia is looking over at Syntyche thinking and saying, I sure hope she's listening to what Paul says. Syntyche doing the same, looking over and saying, I sure hope Eudia is listening to this. The church knew there was disunity amongst the body there. You can only imagine the church members, some that had been pulled over to Eudia's side, some that were siding with Syntyche, looking over as this letter was being read, I sure hope they are listening to this. Everyone with an ear to hear would have known that what Paul had written to them was timely and it was true. Jesus' church was and is to be united. Sadly, here in Philippi, this unity had crept into the church. Look to your Bibles, begin at verse number 2. I implore Eudia. And I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Let's pray together. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you for it, that it is true that it is authoritative, that it is sufficient, Lord, because you are the author. Father, I thank you, having studied this word this week, Lord, the work you did in my heart. I pray, Lord, you'd continue that work of sanctification, Lord, and I pray you would do that in your church today. Lord, take your word and apply it to our hearts, Lord. I pray that in your power and your strength, this word would be communicated. Father, I pray, as, as John the Baptist said, that Jesus would increase and that I would decrease. Lord, take your word this morning and please use it to sanctify your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So beginning there at verse number two, I implore Euodia and I implore Syntyche. That Greek word for implore, it means to come alongside and help, to give aid, and notice this, the same instructions are given to each one. I implore Eodia and I implore Syntyche. 
Paul does not take sides. Each of them had a responsibility for the discord that was between them, and fault is not assigned. Now this discord that was between them, we're not clear exactly what it was, but we do know that it was significant. We do know that it was causing significant harm within the church at Philippi, so significant that Paul would call these two out by name before the entire church and tell them to be of the same mind. Verse 2, Paul's implored them, he says, to be of the same mind in the Lord. This means to agree. It means to cherish the same things. It means to live harmoniously. The word translated mind is used 11 times in Philippians. Remember just a couple of the examples from a moment ago in Philippians 2 verse 2. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then chapter 3, 15 and 16, therefore let us as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. It was important that these two women be of the same mind. This would only happen if they were to be of the same mind in the Lord. That phrase, in the Lord, is very important throughout Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. By my count, he uses that term nine times. Just a few of them here. If you'll turn in your Bibles to chapter 1, verse 12. We're going to work through a few of these passages. You'll see this term used over and over again. Chapter 1, verse 12, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Turn to the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel. Therefore I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Continues on into verse 25. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on, on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking for, in your service toward me." Turn in your Bible to chapter 3, verse 1. We see it again. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And then lastly, chapter 4, verse 1, immediately preceding what we're reading today. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. See, Paul had laid the foundation throughout this letter. The church there in Philippi was to be in the Lord. Remember what we looked at that last week and what it looks like, a Christian's foundation. The very foundation a Christian has is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grounded 
in what their Savior, the Lord Jesus, accomplished when He redeemed them from sin and death. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is grounded in the reality that a Christian is a child of God. The Bible says of Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. See, a Christian's foundation is grounded in the reality that the Christian life is not lived by our own strength. The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The call in verse 2 was for Iodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. This came from the very foundation that they had, who they were in Christ. Paul does not tell them to brainstorm and try to find something to unite around. They have a Savior. His name is Jesus, and He is Lord. They were to unite around Him. Here at Balfour, we have a Savior. His name is Jesus. He is Lord. We are to unite around Him. Notice also, these ladies were not being told to unite around false teaching. There's no indication in the Scriptures that Iodia and Syntyche had a disagreed over a fundamental Christian doctrine. Paul is not asking them to agree to disagree for the sake of unity. He's calling them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Turn back in your Bibles to chapter 2, verse 2. This is where the path to unity is laid out for Yodia, for Syntyche, for each one of us. We must pursue unity through humility. If you found your place, please say amen. Look at verse 2. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. They're called to unity through humility. Do they have an example they could look to? Do we have an example? that we can look to. Absolutely we do. The Lord Jesus. Look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If there is discord between you and another brother or sister in Christ, pursue unity through humility. Set your eyes on your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your sin to God and ask for forgiveness. Confess your sin to one another and ask for forgiveness. The same holds true to avoid discord between you and another brother and sister in Christ. Pursue unity through humility. Set your eyes on your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul has made his appeal that Iodia and Syntyche be of the same mind in the Lord. We see here in verse 3 that this appeal is not only for Iodia and Syntyche to work out on their own. 
Paul appeals to another believer for help. Look to your Bible, verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion. Notice the slight difference between verses 2 and 3. Verse 2, we have the word implored. Here we have urged. That word implored, it carried with it a higher level of authority. Paul is is calling on his apostolic authority and, and, and calling these two women to be of the same mind. Here we have a word that's more closely related to asking. It's the sense that Paul is asking a fellow believer to help him in what needs to be done. He makes a similar appeal in Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. The Bible says in Philemon 1, 8 through 11, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but is now unprofitable to me. So Paul makes an appeal to this true companion. That word true identifies this individual as a fellow follower of Christ who Paul has seen faithfulness in his life. Someone who Paul has seen the evidence of their salvation being worked out with fear and trembling. Paul goes a step further, and I urge you also, true companion. The King James captures this word companion well, using the word yoke fellow. It was a term that was originally used to describe a yoke, a wooden yoke, that was placed around the neck of two plowing animals. These animals were bound together. They were contributing to the work. It was later used to describe individuals who worked toward the same goal, putting their efforts to work with one another. They're not pulling in different directions. They're heading in the same direction. Now, there is some speculation as to who is this true companion. We've got to be honest and say the Bible does not answer it. For us, we, we, the Bible does not tell us who this true companion is. Some believe it was the proper name of an individual. This individual's name was translated companion. Others believe it to be Epaphroditus or Luke. Some believe it's the whole church that's being called upon. We cannot say with certainty who this true companion is, but I do believe that when this letter was read, the individual knew who it was, I believe Yodia and Syntyche knew who this was, and I believe the church knew exactly who who Paul was calling upon. So what is it that Paul is urging this true companion to do? Look to your Bible, verse 3. The Bible says, help these women. Now Yodia and Syntyche were not of the same mind. Paul had instructed them to be of the same mind in the Lord. He solicited the help of a true companion in doing this. This word translated help, it means more than just words of encouragement or nudging someone in the right direction. It's literally translated take hold of. Keep your spot here in Philippians, but turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. Verse number 1, Luke chapter 5, verse number 1. Here we have Jesus calling four fishermen to be his disciples. If you found your place, Luke chapter 5, verse 1, please say amen. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, "'Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch.' But Simon answered and said to him, "'Master,' We have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. 
So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. There's that word, to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. You see that picture in your mind. The net was filled with fish. It was beginning to tear apart. Jesus has the disciples, the disciples call for their friends, come and help us. They needed their friends to come and grab a hold of that net, to pull it back together so that it would not break. Paul is urging this true companion, help these women. They're being torn apart from one another. Take hold of them. Bring them back together. Don't gloss over that a fellow believer was called upon to assist. Yes, there was discord between Yodia and Syntyche. Yes, it was impacting the church. The problem was not for those two to merely work out on their own. Paul calls another believer alongside to help. Right now, in the Southern Baptist Convention, Mike Stone, who was the past chairman of the executive committee, and he was a candidate for the 2021 SBC president, he has brought a lawsuit against Russell Moore, who was the former president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, arguments have been made condemning both Stone and Moore for the actions that brought them to this point. I'm not going to go into the particulars of the issues these two men have with one another. It's public information. You can search it out. What troubles me about this situation that we see between these two men is both of them profess to love Christ. They profess to love His church. They profess to love Jesus' word. Yet the actions being taken violate the clear teaching of 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. As we look at these, at these two individuals who profess Christ, how is it that they have gotten to a point where a lawsuit is necessary? Perhaps the reason is found in the question that's asked in 1 Corinthians 6, 5. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? Is it not possible for these two men to be brought together by a true companion in Christ? Is there not a brother in Christ who knows both of these men, can bring them together and say, repent? Pursue unity through humility. You're bringing shame upon yourselves and the witness that you give of Christ. Folks, let it never be said of the saints here at Balfour. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? As discord or disunity bubbles up, Within this body, remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. If you see discord between your brothers and sisters in Christ, love them enough to take hold of them and bring them back together. So Paul makes his appeal to a true companion now he offers two descriptions of Yodia and Syntyche. Look to the Bible, verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers. That word translated labored is used one other time in the New Testament. It's found in Philippians 1, verse 27. There it's translated striving together. 
The Bible says in Philippians 1.27, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. That word there translated labored here in verse number 3 was used in Greek culture to describe an athletic event. Specifically, it was used in Greek culture to describe a team athletic event. Each member working toward the same goal. In the Philippian church, the goal was not athletic success. It was faithfulness to the work of the gospel. The good news that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. That's what we unite around. That is what we labor for. Eodia and Syntyche labored with Paul in the Gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of his fellow workers. You see, at one time, the Gospel work being done had been a team effort in Philippi. Everybody was attached together, everybody was laboring, everybody was heading the same direction, everyone had been pressing toward the same goal, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul identifies these two women as as laborers. They had worked for the gospel there in Philippi. Next, look at verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Whose names are in the book of life. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out 70 disciples to preach on the kingdom of God. The disciples returned joyfully over the fact, and they said, even the demons are subject to us in Jesus' name. Jesus said to them in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The Bible says in Revelation 21, verses 22 through 27, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter into enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The glories of heaven are reserved for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Paul recognized Iodia and Syntyche as believers. They were not unbelievers who had made their way into the church, played the part, acted like a Christian for a period of time, given the church the impression that they were Christians. Paul had witnessed the fruit of their salvation. He had confidence that their names were written in the book of life, the book in which the names of those redeemed by God are written. These two ladies may have been Roman citizens living in Philippi, but Paul reminds them once again of their true citizenship. They were citizens of heaven. As a body of believers here at Balfour, we must guard against disunity. Every indication in the text points to these two women being followers of Christ. They labored with Paul in the gospel. Their names are in the book of life. In the words of Philippians 2.12, they had been working out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Here's the caution, however. Their maturity as believers did not provide immunity against disunity. Every one of us must work to protect the unity of the body here at Balfour. We cannot rest on past unity. We must actively pursue present unity. 
We must, as instructed in Ephesians, walk in unity. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 1, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Church, we have a Savior to unite around. We have a Savior in which we can unite around together. Our Savior prayed for us that we would be united. The Bible said, records this prayer in John 17, I do not pray for these alone, meaning His disciples. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word, that they all may be one as You, Father, are in Me and I in You, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Our Lord prayed for our unity. Our unity as believers in Christ gives a testimony that we are in the Lord. Consider as we close the emphasis on partnership that's placed in just these two verses. Iodia and Syntyche were to be of the same mind in the Lord. They were called to a a partnership there. Then we see four specific partnerships are mentioned in verse 3. Paul appeals to his true companion. Remember that word yoke fellow. That was someone who was bounded to, to Paul to serve the Lord together. He appeals to this individual to help these women, both of them. Notice that. Not one, not the other. He's to help both of them. Both of whom labored with Paul in the gospel. Both of whom labored in the gospel with Clement also. Both of whom labored with the rest of Paul's fellow workers. We see that partnership there within the body of Christ. Believers bound together serving the Lord. As I have surveyed the cultural landscape over the last couple of years, I firmly believe that we live in what I, just, I call myself a walk-away culture. We live in a culture that is just marked by disunity, and we live in a culture that people will just readily walk away from another. They'll walk away from marriages. They'll walk away from families. They'll walk away from jobs. They'll walk away from responsibilities. Jesus' church must not be composed of walk-away Christians. Jesus' church must be made up of believers who desire to pursue Christ. Believers who desire to pursue Christ and do so together throughout the Scriptures we see this appeal. The body of Christ is not to be separated. The body of Christ is to be united as we pursue Christ together. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the example we have in the text today. Lord, of your call for your church to be united. Father, we look around this culture. Lord, we look around at the events taking place all around us. Lord, and we see disunity, we see discord, we see folks willing to just toss their hands up in the air and walk away. Father, let that not be said of your church. And please, Lord, let, not, 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 let that not be said of your church here at Balfour. Lord, help us to be of the same mind in the Lord. Help us, Lord, as disunity may bubble up from time to time. Lord, help there. Help them. Lord, help us that there may be true companions, that there may be co-laborers in the gospel that are willing to grab hold of one another and pull those that are in disunity back together. Lord, we know 
Lord Jesus, this is what you prayed for. Lord, help us to be faithful, to live out your commands. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.